Anya, if you will. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, I would like to welcome you, all of you to this event and especially thank our speakers for being here. Uh, this is the uh, second panel um, uh, on Ukrainian Russian geopolitics. Some of you might have attended the first panel, which was held on June 2nd with the um, Ukrainian scholar activists and those who um, did not attend it can access the recording of that conversation on the uh, Haven's Rights Center uh, website. Um, as Adrian said, um, after I introduce um, the speakers, each of them will speak for up to 15 minutes and that should leave us ample time for uh, Q&A. So today we have with us Natalia Savelyeva, Alek Juravlyov, um, and Ilya Matveev. Natalia Savelyeva has a doctoral degree in sociology from the Russian Academy of Sciences and currently is a research fellow at the Center for European Policy Analysis in Washington, DC. Natalia is an alumna of UW-Madison of sorts. Um, she had a postdoctoral fellowship at Krika in 2019-2020, and her current scholarship explores um, issues of labor, uh, protest movements in Russia and Ukraine, and um, problems of war conflicts in the post-Soviet space. Our second speaker will be Alek Juravlyov. Um, he's also a sociologist, and his PhD is from the European uh, University Institute in Florence. Uh, his research is focused on social movements, the sociology of knowledge, Marxism, uh, pragmatic sociology, and the theory of the event as a way of thinking about empirical data in social sciences. He is also a part of uh, the Russian socialist movement and uh, has close ties with independent trade unions in Russia. And the last participant of this uh, panel is Ilya Matveev, who is a political scientist. Uh, with a doctoral degree from Moscow State University. He studies Russia's political economy, inequality, the welfare state, and ideological conflicts. Um, and in addition to his academic work, Ilya co-hosts a Russian language podcast on uh, politics that is called The Political Diary. And he's also a member of the um, editorial collective of Kosle Media, a new bilingual Russian English anti-war platform. All three of our speakers today are affiliated with the Public uh, Sociology Laboratory at the Center for Independent Social Research in St. Petersburg, Russia. The public labs manifesto states, and I quote from the manifesto, the main objective of the laboratory is to combine a professional approach to social research with public engagement. The scientific questions that the public um, sociology lab ra raises relate to relevant social problems linked to the political situation in Russia and all over the world. Moreover, the mission of the laboratory is to combine social engagement and civic responsibility with theoretical and exist existential uh, depth to resolve problems of grand theory through empirical study of social problems. So it is easy to see why the Havens Rights Center invited this folks in particular and not anybody else to talk to us um, today about nationalism, imperialism, and new cleavages in Russia. So please help me welcome all of them. Um, and Natalia, will you st start us off, please? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, thank you very much uh, for having me. And uh, yes, I will start this uh, discussion today and my colleagues are welcome to comment on whatever I say. So yeah, I think that I'm going to start uh, with uh, my vision of uh, this uh, conflict and some points which seem uh, crucial for me uh, in order to understand what is going now, what is going on now, why we have this war, and how did we get uh, here, right? So uh, I don't see this uh, war we have now between Russia and Ukraine as a sort of inevitable continuation of a previous war, this eight, conflict, eight years of conflict in Donbass, and this is how Russia definitely wants to present it. And so I would say there is uh, some, uh, th th there is some uh, things which um, kind of we see continuity in them between those two conflicts, but there is also uh, an important ruptures and important differences between those two conflicts. So the first thing I want to focus on is uh, uh, that we, what we see is uh, different logics uh, of mobilization 
for those two conflicts. So during uh, at least the beginning of the Donbass conflicts in 2014, we saw a lot of uh, grassroots mobilization, especially we talk about those people who joined the Russian armed group in Donbass. And the same was from the pro-Ukrainian side. Right, uh, but what we see now uh, is that it's much more forced mobilization that's like troops which participate in this war, that's basically Russian soldiers. And if we look at the interviews with uh, um, people who joined the Donbass conflict in 2014, interviews, I mean, which were conducted before this uh, new war uh, launched, or with on interviews uh, with the, uh, the mercenaries who, uh, for example, mer mercenaries from Wagner Group, so many of them said that like, yeah, no way we would join this war something is going to happen and we don't want to be the part of it. So the, the like uh, mobilization we observe now is very different from what we had in 2014. And I will say that in general, I mean, those two conflicts, they're so much presented by uh, Russian media and Russian state officials as a sort of like the war we have now is a sort of inevitable, right? But for me, it's more like this very famous quotation that's first we have, uh, we first we have some events which happen as a tragedy and then as a farce. And what I see in those events now is the sort of Russia tries to repeat the scenario of the previous uh, Donbass conflict, the scenario of Crimea, but it's very, very different. It's impossible to just reproduce that. Right. For example, we see this. Uh, we we see uh, that in occupied uh, by Russian army cities, we see this the appearance of uh, Soviet uh, symbols. And if in 2014, 16, 17, there was like an important thing for the Donbas region because of the traditions of the memories, because of the traditions of commemoration of the Great Patriotic War, now it's like something which was just brought, something which was imposed, something which was installed there. And the same is what is happening with those local administrations. And if in 2014 and 15 and 16, there was a lot of um, grassroots organization and people in Donbass, they try to take over local administrations. And at least like during the first year, there was an attempt to create uh, the, new, uh, the new organs, which will just replace uh, the state structures, then those attempts that was just over. And now we see a sort of like that they try to reproduce the same thing, but just by imposing, just just by basically hiring some people who will say, yes, we are we represent those like Ukrainian people uh, who are talking, uh, who just represents their voice of Ukrainians. And um, uh, during the last uh, five months, I've been uh, working uh, at Washington DC uh, at a think tank uh, who is focused on post-Soviet space and on Europe. And that uh, changed also a lot my vision of this conflict. I, I want to say a couple of words about that. So first there was this belief that uh, implementation of Minsk agreements can bring us somewhere, right? That it can brings us to like peace in the region. But if we look back uh, now, it seems uh, just impossible because now if we look like at the last uh, eight years, it is pretty clear that Minsk agreements were just the way for Russia to impose to make Ukraine a sort of subaltern to control its to control its political space and to preserve its like dominated domination over the region, and the second thing which kind of became uh, pretty obvious to me I don't know if I'm correct in that uh, or not. So there was a lot of discussions about uh, Russia's legitimate security concerns. I mean, before this war started, before Russia attacked Ukraine. And I think like after four months of the war, we should say that like there was no concerns, right? There is no legitimate concerns for, for any country just to attack another country and start killing people there. And um, yeah, so both those things like Russia legitimate concerns and Minsk agreements, that was probably a sort of like very misleading, very misleading just line of discussion. 
Uh, I mean, at least this is how I see it now. And I want to say a couple of things about uh, the context, which seems for me very important for this particular situation. So the third thing is like geopolitical context, but as I said, I don't believe in this Russia legitimate security concerns, but what was important for this conflict is that I guess for Putin and for like several people around him, what was happening in the world during like last year, uh, it was considered as a sort of a window of opportunity because uh, there was like a mass after two years of pandemic and US was focused on its own like crises, Black Lives Matters, and Biden was considered as a weak president. And in Germany, we had a new like America left. And in Ukraine, uh, Zelensky also, he was losing his popularity and his ratings uh, were going down. And right before the war was like, I guess it's lower point. And I guess there was also this hope that Russia people that again, that it is possible to repeat a history, which is not possible, as we can see now, right, and that we will have a sort of Crimean scenario, but with the whole Ukraine, so a sort of like small, uh, short and victorious war, nobody would care about it, Russian people wouldn't notice that, um, US and Europe would not pay attention to that, and everything will be just again, Ukrainian people would just give up, uh, give up to Russia and Russia will take over the region, but that didn't happen. I think that is very important to understand and that's rarely uh, discussed is that Russian domestic situation, which I think um, let us understand much better what's like why we have this war because if we look from this point uh from this perspective this war doesn't seem uh that uh, unpredictable especially i mean there is this i would say like simple explanation uh which is like when putin's ratings go down he launched a war and i remember that i saw a presentation which actually demonstrates that so ratings goes down we had like the ambassador premier and now also there was like the lowest pointing the lowest lowest and uh, he had the lowest ratings before the war and now we have this war right but i think that's a little bit more complicated here and um the answer can come from the last 10 years of the evolution of political regime in russia because what we've been observing is that in 2011 we had those uh for fair election movement like big mobilization in russia pretty unusual which produced um a lot of interesting effects. Uh, and one of those effects, and the most important one, this is what our study with my colleagues from Public Sociology Lab um, demonstrates. This is like a general politicization of society. So people stop thinking about politics as if it were something dirty and they shouldn't participate in that. So people started join, joining a lot of uh, local protest movements, a lot of local initiatives. And even if we see it 2019 and 20, uh, 20 rallies in support of Navalny, we will see there are a lot of new people. And we can see that a lot of those people, they were ready to actually come just not to fight with police, but I mean, the level of repression and police, uh, police oppression in those years, that was just uncomparable to what we had in 2011. So there was definitely this increased politicization and increased uh, belief of the people that they actually have to be there, they have to participate, that politics is for them, that it is important to be there. And that doesn't matter if they didn't support Navalny, I mean, and we know from the polls and we know from our interviews that many people, they didn't support Navalny who joined the rallies, but still they believe that it is important to be there. And this is one tendency and the state responded to this like growing uh, democratization and politicization with the growing repression and uh, growing like shutting down of all this, let's say, idea that Russia can be a democratic country, right? This um, Medvedev's, um, uh, yeah, I guess it was about like Medvedev's term, but they decided that we don't need that in Russia. Russia doesn't need that. And they responded with like growing repression. And now we kind of see like the, the end of this term, like growing democratization, a response from Russian state. And now we're at that point that we have like real uh, massive uh, mass repression. The people go to prison for like, nothing and even like a sort of 
oh gosh, okay. So Russian state became more fascist. And the third thing which I believe is important is the Putin factor, which was discussed a lot. And I would say that here we also see this, the same thing. We see sort of like a continuity and a rupture because we know that Putin uh, repeated consistently that uh, Ukraine is not a real state. It's not really a real country. And he said that in 2002, 2009, and that Ukrainian language is not a real language and so on and so on. And actually that Ukraine is basically part of this like imaginary uh, Russian world. But what is different, uh, what, uh, what is different in 2022 that uh, he kind of moved from those words about how Ukraine is not a real country to actions. You know, he kind of like changed his political portfolio. He was, and he was always described as this very rational political actor. And suddenly in like last two years, we were observing this like move that he just switched from this area of real politique uh, to the world of like long durée history when he, uh, became a sort of a historical figure in his own uh, eyes, comparable with Peter the First and uh, Vladimir the Great and whatever, right? So he kind of reimagined himself. And uh, I see, I think that this war, war is just the part of this shift which happened with Putin himself. <laughs> and he became, when he just decided that now he wants to be this, the great historical guy who will uh, turn, who will just bring Russian back its greatness. And we also see the very interesting shift in narrative. And I want here to make this comparison between the best conflict and this war now, because I started the narratives of uh, pro-Russian combatants back in 2016, 17, it was like basically three different narratives. And one of them was about uh, this uh, big uh, contradiction, like big everlasting battle between the West and the Russian world. And uh, this narrative, it belonged to a very uh, specific group of people. There was the people from the previous military experience with some connection to Russian face bail, military services, so kind of mercenaries, people with very like conspiracy mindset. And what is interesting, like in 2015, 14, 16, 17, there was just one of the narratives there. It was just other narratives that were like, the whole bunch of narratives behind the previous conflict. But now we see how this narrative about how Russia have to fight the West and has its own world and how the West always hated Russia, we see that this uh, narrative, it is dominating now, right? And I think that this is a very important detail here because it also tells us a lot. And I guess that confirms this idea that was just few people around Putin who uh, influenced his decision and with whom he uh, made this decision to attack Ukraine. So that's people, are pretty, people who are pretty close to military and to security uh, agencies. And the last thing which has really surprised me about the current war, as I said, I'm always just coming back to this metaphor of the history who repeats, which repeats twice, first as a tragedy, then as a farce. Uh, we see similar narratives and we see a sort of similar feelings which stay behind that like whole mobilization, like in Russian people, why they support this war and how Russian state officials and media try to fuel the support for this war. And we see here like two basic emotions. Those emotions are the same as we saw in 2014, that's fear and resentment. So people basically, uh, the one point is Russia will be destroyed if it, if it like would not attack if it would not fight, and um, that uh, Russia is actually undermined. Russia is great, but nobody loves Russia, and everybody wants just to humiliate it. And that's interesting that we saw the same, like those same two emotions in 2014 with the combatants who we interviewed. But the difference is that in 2014, 15, 16, those uh, narratives, they kind of were based on real events. I mean, there was like fights in Kyiv, there was the fire in Odessa, there was like real violence there, which preceded and sort of like confirmed 
these two powerful emotions. And uh, in case of 2022, we still uh, see like those words about those emotions and emotions themselves, but we don't see uh, any events which can say like, yeah, that's why I believe that it is happening. So we see how those emotions, they are grounded in like the realm of imaginary, in a realm of like some ideology, right? So there's like some imagined fear and imagined resentment, which is based on some narrative which has almost nothing in common with the reality itself. And uh, I guess I'm moving to uh, my last uh, point, which is about uh, left movement and about what can be done in uh, this particular situation and about some like dilemmas which this situation make us to face with. So before uh, this war and for the long time, there was a lot of critique uh, toward NATO, right? Because it's a like militarized organization and there was a lot of critique toward US and that's imperial ambitions. But the problem, like the, uh, <laughs> the challenge of uh, the situation in, in which we find our, ourselves now is that we see that after and the weakening of NATO during the Trump, uh, uh, during uh, years of Trump presidency, we see how the response to this war come, how, how that the response to this war is actually the strengthening of NATO. And the same we see with the European Union. So there was a lot of critique about European Union and its politics, especially like toward Greece, after the Greece crisis. But we see that uh, the response to the war is strengthening of the European Union. And that comes, uh, that just brings us to this situation that like, Yes, it seems that there is no other alternative. So we have uh, kind of leftist ideas somewhere and critique which comes from the left, but the current situation, it sort of disarmed us, right? We have nothing. We have like, if we're talking about this real situation and the real response to the situation, there is no alternative. There is no alternative to NATO. There is no alternatives to politics, which has been already existed. There is no alternatives to like military involvement. And I think that this is also uh, a sign of the weakness of uh, the leftist third and leftist movement, right? Because we haven't seen a lot of good responses from the side of leftist um, intellectual and intellectuals and some good and like grounded in the data and real expertise analysis, but we also don't see any, uh, any options proposed by leftists to like how we can deal with this conflict. And that makes ourselves just to stick with already existing op options. Like Finland joined NATO, uh, Northern Europe joined NATO, NATO is straightening, US, we wouldn't say it's straightening, but it's sort of like we have this confirmation that actually, yes, to have NATO is good, to have like a big power like US is a good thing because somebody should have all those like guns and tanks to send it to another country in case we have the situation. And I think that's like in like, our situation that's the main challenge uh, leftists have to deal with and have to come up with some sort of like ideas what what kind of alternative from the left we can give to respond to this situation not like in some distant future not with some like just ideological dreams about how life can be better somewhere later but like right now what we can do so what what, what can be the alternative so yeah, I guess I will stop here. Thank you very much, Natalia. Um, and next uh, we'll hear from Oleg. Yeah, uh, thank you. I, I I will try to be short. So uh, I I agree with Natasha on uh, the very important thing that uh, the war was not uh, inevitable. It was actually free choice, free choice of uh, the Putin's regime to to attack Ukraine. So. I just want to, to focus on uh, the internal dynamics of, of, of Russian society, uh, on, to focus on internal dynamics of Russian politics in order to uh, explain uh, why Putin's regime turned out to be in this condition of free choice. So uh, there is a uh, 
famous book of uh, Alexei Yurchak uh, about uh, the late Soviet Union. Uh, it was forever until uh, it was no more. Uh, this is a story about uh, Soviet people who believed that the Soviet Union uh, will be for forever, but then suddenly it collapsed. And then uh, uh, post Soviet people realized that maybe it was a mistake. So uh, I, I want to, 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 to tell the, the story uh, of, of, of myself and of, of Natasha and Ilya because we worked together um, like during 15 years. So uh, 15 years ago, uh, when we were students, uh, we thought that uh, so-called depoliticization, uh, the condition of political passivity uh, will last forever. And we were dissatisfied with, with, with that and we expected like when politicization will, will come, when the society will be politicized. Uh, and, and, uh, uh, and we even uh, uh, um, started our work in order to, to study why people are so politically passive in Russia. Uh, 15 years later, we have like total politicization and we ho have the war. So we, we could not imagine that uh, this process uh, will be such, uh, such fast. Uh, so, but this politicization was uh, very special. Uh, uh, Natasha mentioned uh, this major event of political protest in Russia. It happened in uh, 2011, 2012, uh, when many people came to the streets to protest against Putin's regime, which uh, 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 falsified, uh, which, which, which committed electoral fraud. And uh, that time we were very excited. So we decided that uh, depoliticization is over in Russia. Now we will start depoliticization. We uh, also uh, came to the streets to take interviews with protesters. Uh, we were excited. Uh, and uh, mm, what happened next? Uh, yeah, but what, 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 what was important about this movement? The protest movement in Russia in 2011, 2012, this sudden unexpected protest movement uh, did not articulate any concrete demands, did not articulate any class interests. What the protesters uh, delivered to themselves and to those in power was like, we are better than you, those in power. So not we demand this reform, this change, but we are uh, like, you are immoral, we are, we are moral. Uh, uh, um, you are bad guys, we are good guys, and we have this new wonderful world of, of, of political action, of solidarity, and we uh, don't want to, uh, to go to, to, to power, to, to be involved in like uh, everyday life uh, um, in politics. We, we, we don't want to become deputies. So they enjoyed, they cherished, this uh, 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 new public space. Uh, and um, it was very similar to Euromaidan as well. How Putin and his uh, regime responded to this politicization? The regime uh, responded to both Euromaidan in Ukraine and this for fair election movement in Russia by politicization of itself. So, in a, in a sense, Putin's regime created its own uh, world of, of, of uh, more politicized state because before uh, Putin's state looked uh, very, very economic. So they uh, uh, were stealing money, distributed uh, some money among 
oligarchs and poor people uh, did some things, but uh, they never looked very political. Uh, after 2014, uh, they decided to, to annex Crimea and to support uh, Donbass separatists. But at the same time, what was important was that they did not try to mobilize its own audience. Somehow they uh, uh, distributed conservative mood uh, among society, but it was rather uh, counter politicization of the regime itself than politicization of its audience. Uh, and this is the problem that these waves of politicization of the society and counter politicization of the state uh, represented like parallel worlds. Uh, they did not discuss with each other uh, the future. And even if we look at a uh, continuation of Russian protest movement, we can see that uh, many protesters became activists, as Natasha uh, also said. But what uh, these activists did, they uh, started doing some small things like local activism. Uh, but at the same time, uh, by doing these things, they tried to convince that Putin is a bad guy. So uh, we try to, to uh, stop this uh, deforestation of, of, of our forest. But who, who started this uh, uh, deforestation? It is, it is Putin. So uh, they were successful in delegitimizing de de authorities, but they kept uh, uh, themselves in this like uh, special world of uh, of uh, protest politics. Uh, and what we have now, we have uh, the last, I hope, uh, the last wave of uh, politicization of regime. And this politicization of political regime is not anyhow based on popular mobilization. So uh, it is like uh, uh, self-organization, constituent power, uh, but made by the state. Uh, so the state liberated itself from the society through politicization of itself and started the war. Uh, and what is, what is uh, important, and this will be my last point. Now uh, we uh, collected uh, almost 200 interviews with ordinary Russian people, uh, among which we have supporters of the war, uh, people who are against the war, and people who did not decide yet. So what many of supporters and sympathizers say, they say, not all of them, but, but really many, they, some, they say something like, I support the special military operation, but not because I believe it is justified. I just, I just uh, think that those in power are more informed, so maybe they know what they what they do uh, we don't like it to be honest but they pretend they know that it is it is good so maybe they are true uh, we have the very strange kind of political representation when you delegate your power to judge about the world to those in power but not because you share with them some common interests or common values, but quite the opposite, because they are like special group of people who, who, who maybe have like more information. So this is political representation, which is based not on political connection between the society and the state, but which is based on uh, a separation of this 
of this world. So uh, my point is that uh, these waves of politicization of the society and counter politicization of the state represented two parallel dynamics uh, which finally ended with uh, a kind of uh, revolutionary, aggressive, conservative state, which is not basing itself on popular support, by, but acting uh, in a self-organized way. Uh, and this is our uh, big problem. So, and two to words about what is to be done. I think uh, that leftists now, and I agree again with Natasha here, now should try to first um, reimagine and uh, develop uh, uh, the idea and proto institutions of of the security, international security system, and to develop the program of reforms, which can be introduced after the regime change in Russia. Thank you. Thank you very much, Oleg. And Ilya, now the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, I will start the presentation. I'm the one with the PowerPoint. Sorry, I can do without them. Um, uh, so I will try to take a step back and to look into a more long-term picture in terms of the development of Russian history and the development of Russian imperialism in history. So my friends and my colleagues, they talked about recent years, recent decades, so two decades of uh, Putin's power, but I will try to look uh, to even bigger picture and to try to understand uh, how did we get here? Because this was one of the questions uh, sent to us by uh, by Ari. And so, how did we get here? And I think that in order to answer this question, we need to look not just at recent years, not just the development of situations since 2014, and not even uh, you know in the last 30 years. We need to look at the last hundred years of Russian history, and this is what I will try to do. So I will start with this quote by Angela Merkel, which is uh, quite famous, in fact. Uh, when Russia uh, began annexing Crimea uh, in March 2014, uh, she said, actions modeled on those of the 19th and the 20th century are thus being carried out in the 21st century. And in her speech, she repeated many times that what Putin is doing reminds her of uh, not, not even the previous century, but the century before the previous century. You know, it reminds her of the 19th century, the, the century of the great empires. And uh, mm, this, uh, mm, this phrase immediately rings true. So when you hear it, this is what uh, you, you immediately agree with it, because this is exactly uh, what, what Putin's actions uh, look like. They look uh, anachronistic, so something from the past. They look like something from, uh, you know, you cannot even imagine that something like that is happening right before our eyes. And his actions and also his rhetoric, extreme conservative reactionary rhetoric that Alek has already mentioned, uh, looks like something straight out of the 19th century. So this is really a paradox. And I think that Merkel was really onto something when she said it, and I will try to unpack this in my, in my talk. So let's start with the year 1918. That was the year when the First World War ended. And that was also the year when uh, four great empires uh, ended. So the German Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Russian Empire, and the Ottoman Empire. So the fall of great uh, continental empires. And uh, we know that our defeated empires too completely receded into the past. 
So the Austro-Hungarian Empire and uh, the Ottoman Empire never reappeared in history. But uh, the German Empire, of course, after this period of the Weimar Republic, reappeared again in this monstrous form of uh, the Third Reich and was uh, defeated again. And after that, this was the final end of uh, imperial ambitions of the German state. But there was only one empire that did not, in fact, disappear, even though uh, Russian empire you know, ended its existence, it was recreated as, uh, as the Soviet state and uh, uh, the Soviet state was really paradoxical because it explicitly rejected the imperial principle of uh, um, imposing a certain identity on uh, colonized you know, peoples, colonized populations. The Soviet Union was more complex than that. It actually recognized uh, the right of self-determination of the peoples who were part of uh, the Soviet Union. And uh, this is what Putin criticizes all the time now. He says, Basically, the Soviet Union allowed Ukrainians to be Ukrainians. That was the biggest mistake. So the Soviet Union recognized Ukrainians as a nation, right? And this was actually true. The Soviet Union did recognize Ukrainians and uh, Belarus uh, people and Kazakh people as, as nations. So, but at the same time, it maintained a very powerful centralized state and it maintained the territory that corresponded to the territory of the Russian Empire. So this was paradoxical because Ottoman Empire did not uh, you know, have its territory. Uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire lost its territory and German Empire eventually lost its territory, but uh, Russian Empire somehow recreated itself in the form of the Soviet Union, maintaining its own territorial borders. So uh, the Soviet Union paradoxically it was like a lease of life to the imperial principle because on the one hand it develops the national and cultural autonomy of the soviet republics maintaining their right to self-determination on the other hand it completely denied their political autonomy because uh, the soviet union was an authoritarian you know state that uh, did not allow any kind of political autonomy to the people in general and to um, various nations that were part of it in particular. So the United States invented a new kind of you know, global power that was not based on the principle of territoriality. It was based on the principle of economic domination that did not require territorial conquest. But the Soviet Union, perhaps the only empire in the world, continued to practice this territorial power. This is paradoxical. So it continued to practice this territorial power, even though um, it was not an empire in the classical sense, because it was not denying this cultural and uh, uh, national autonomy of its you know, subject nations. So, uh, and then the central thesis of my talk is that the time is out of joint. So the famous phrase from Shakespeare, uh, Russian 1918 finally came only in 1991 when the Soviet Union uh, collapsed. So strangely, uh, the Russian empire had a lease of, a lease of life. So it had this uh, spectral existence in the next uh, decades after this fine, you know, official end. And it finally collapsed only in 1991. This is why Russian history is sort of dislocated. It is uh, not, uh, synchronous with the uh, European history. It's not synchronous with the history of the countries. In the way. And this is why we have this strange paradox that uh, uh, the Soviet Union really has this paradoxical place in this war, in Putin's rhetoric, in the Kremlin's rhetoric, because on the one hand, uh, so Putin said, the principle of self-determination of nations advocated by Lenin is declared the main evil and the time bomb under the Russian state. So Putin criticizes the Soviet Union, Putin criticizes Lenin specifically for allowing this principle of self-determination to uh, have influence on the nature of the Soviet Union. But at the same time, uh, the Soviet Union is the point of reference to this re recent imperial ambitions. And this is why really tanks go into battle with red flags right now. So the tanks uh, on, the, on the Russian side, they go into battle with red flags 
and uh, a lot of different symbols from the Soviet time, they are now present in this war. Even though Putin rejects the Soviet Union as a bad model of uh, a union of nations that recognizes Ukraine as a nation, and according to Putin, this is the root of all problems that Russia has right now, that Ukraine was recognized as a separate nation by Lenin. That was a mistake. But at the same time, Soviet Union is this point of reference for people who actually fight in this war. And I think that this paradox uh, is explained by the paradoxical nature of the Soviet Union itself. That on the one hand, it was, uh, uh, you know, um, a recreated Russian empire in its borders. On the other hand, it was not really based on the imperial principle. It was based on the principle of self-determination. So the question is, uh, what, what are the two futures that we have now? And one future, one possible future, I still hope that there is a future like that for Russia, is that uh, Russian 1918, you know, the year of the fall of empires, finally happens with Russia at some point, and Russia, uh, you know, transforms from an empire into a sort of normal nation state. If there is a normal nation state on earth, then Russia should be a normal nation state. So Russia should go back to its 1991 borders and try to reinvent itself as, uh, as Germany did after the Second World War. This is a positive scenario that Russia finally stops being an empire and this uh, historical anomaly finally stops and Russia reinvents itself as something new, right? So this is one future. Another future is much uh, more pessimistic that maybe the age of empires, in fact, comes back everywhere around the world, not just in Russia, but the world itself is moving back, is moving back into the past. It is moving in the age of empires. And the second picture is uh, uh, Uyghur people in Xinjiang that are being retrained by the Chinese state, right? and Chinese state denies their national self-determination and basically tries to turn them into Chinese, just like the Russian state tries to turn uh, Ukrainians into Russians right now. I see this as very compatible processes. And so maybe what Russia does is not this strange return to the past, but maybe it's a harbinger of uh, this quite awful future in, these, uh, in which imperial practices and practices of this violent nationalism are being recreated, right? So China uh, goes in this direction, Russia goes in this di direction, uh, Turkey actually goes in this direction by trying to recreate, you know, the Ottoman Empire, or at least it definitely has these imperial impulses. So maybe we just, the whole world goes back to the age of empires and in that sense, we cannot hope that Russia will stop being an empire. It will be just part of this new world of empires. So these are two futures that I see. And obviously, I support the first one. I hope that it is realizable. And the big question uh, to us as Russians is, what do we need? What kind of historical opportunity is there to follow the first path and not to follow the second path? So this is what I would like to reflect upon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elia. And thank you again to Natalia and Oleg. And uh, now we have, um, we have time for Q&A. So there are two ways that um, you can ask a question. First, you can raise your hand virtually. Um, and to do that, you need to click on the reactions button at the bottom of your screen and then click on uh, the raise hand um, icon. Um, and if you, and I'll call on you. And if you uh, choose to go that path, uh, when you speak, uh, can you please turn on your video so that we can see you? Um, and the second way you can ask your question is to type it in the chat and I will read it for you. Um, and before we start with the questions, I, I wanna also mention that to maximize the number of questions that we, uh, we can uh, take and we can, our uh, panelists can address, 
uh, would like to ask you, if possible, to direct um, your question to one specific uh, speaker rather than um, to have everybody answer the same question. And if you're uncertain um, who you would like to ask your question, I can uh, pick for you, um, I can direct your question. So please, if there are um, any questions at the moment, um, let me know. You can raise your hand. Yes, so we have first a uh, question from Esti. Hey, um, thank you. Um, my question is to the last um, speaker. It seems to me that the way uh, the United States and NATO are reacting to this invasion and this war, um, is taking us in the direction of um, going back to a world of empires and of endless hostilities, um, which is interesting because of course the United States has invaded quite a few um, countries, including in, in recent history and has destroyed them just as much as the Russians are destroying Ukraine right now. So um, I, I wonder if you can um, discuss that too, and uh, the way the United States and NATO could choose to um, go into a world of just countries rather than a world of empires. Thank you. Thank you for the question. So um, I don't think that uh, the United States is uh, you know, completely innocent and that the United States do not have imperial ambitions. But what I was trying to indicate that it's a different type of empire, right? So America is a different type of world hegemon because for instance, um, there were uh, military interventions but there was no territorial conquest. So America attacked Iraq, but did not try to annex it. Unlike Russia, that not, not only attacks different countries, but also tries to annex and conquer territory. This is really something from the 19th century. And I think that um, America will fit into this new, new world. So simply because America has uh, the strongest military in the world, but now uh, this won't be an American century as it was called, you know, like 70 years ago. It's, it's a different century in which America will have to compete with everyone else. And uh, I suspect that it will be more dangerous than the, even, you know, the 20th century and uh, the, recent, uh, the recent decades when America was basically the only superpower in the world. So this new world in which all these powerful countries compete with each other, these imperialist blocs compete with each other, it might be even more dangerous because potentially this can result even in the global war, unfortunately, because we know that this previous period of inter-imperialist rivalry before 1914 resulted in a world war. So, and then in another one. So I can only hope that this will not happen, but uh, if we think that this historical analysis is true, then this totally might happen. So, so. We have another question on the chat to Ilya about, um, so the question is from Mike Zilber, uh, what are you trying to illustrate by the picture in the last slide? Right, so uh, the first picture is a white, blue, white flag that was suggested by some opposition leaders and some opposition activists in Russia as a sort of new Russian flag that uh, their, their idea is that uh, the, the flag that Russia has right now 
uh, is uh, implicated in these atrocities that Russia is committing. And therefore, we basically need a new flag to indicate that Russia is a completely new country. So if ever Russia becomes free, it will change uh, even its own flag in order to show that it's now a different country, a different state. So this is the first path, a path of reinvention of Russian national identity and uh, um, elimination of this imperial component from Russian national identity, the first path. And the second path is uh, the pessimistic one in which uh, Russia continues to oppress Ukrainians and Chinese continue to oppress Uyghurs in, uh, in Xinjiang. And this is the picture from Xinjiang. This is why it illustrates the second path, right? So it just illustrates a future in which these neo-imperial, neo-nationalistic projects will dominate everywhere. Okay. Other questions? I see that Bridget uh, is raising her hand physically. Um, Shall I begin? Yeah, please. Yeah. Uh, some years ago, maybe three years ago, in Glasgow University, we had a conference on Soviet nostalgia. Um, which had a number of speakers from all over the, the former um, Soviet Union, emphasizing the degree to which, uh, and this is not a, a sentiment I share at all, there had emerged uh, a feeling of great support for the vanished Soviet regime, uh, Stalinist um, and every other aspect. Um, and I have wondered to myself since then what created that and what's now creating the extraordinary um, severity of the war that we're seeing. Um, and um, it seems to me that we need perhaps to go back to the 1990s and look at the way in which uh, globalization worked uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union uh, with the so-called electric shock therapy or shock therapy, uh, which Naomi Klein work, wrote about so powerfully, um, and to see the sort of contradictions that were created by that um, imposition of free market economics. Um, and um, I wonder whether the, the speakers, perhaps uh, Oleg particularly, uh, could comment on uh, the nature of the contradictions within Russian society at the moment, economically. Um, and of course, one knows that Putin and the oligarchs benefited from that. But do we see in any way that those contradictions are now being dealt with by this form of uh, manufacture of an external enemy. enemy. Yeah, um, thank you. Uh, in fact, uh, although we can say that uh, there is a kind of resentment uh, which were produced, was produced during the 1990s, uh, at the same time, uh, we don't see any strong revanchist mood among poor people uh, who would translate this mood into support of foreign aggression. There are such people, but they represent rather smaller group. Uh, what is important is another thing, is that economically Putin uh, stopped this period of uh, poverty. So uh, during the Putin's terms, economic situation became much better. And the new, let's say, fetish uh, of Putin itself 
uh, Putin himself was stability, economic stability. Uh, and what Putin is doing now, after uh, uh, the first initial plan to fastly uh, take the whole Ukraine uh, didn't happen, uh, is very dangerous in the eyes of many people because they fear that this time of instability will come back. Uh, and of course, economic, economic situation uh, will become uh, much worse than, than, than in, in, in the whole Putin, Putin's period. So, but at the same time, yeah, and uh, uh, it, it is important to, uh, uh, to, 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 to see that um, we don't have really strong support uh, of, 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 uh, of Putin's war. We rather see very passive support of people who are not um, uh, inspired, but rather confused. Uh, so maybe Ilya will, uh, as, as, as political economist, uh, add something, but I, I, I would respond like this. I see that Natalia wants to chime in, please. Yeah, I want to add something about nostalgia. There are two uh, great books uh, which was published recently. The one is uh, by Masha Gassen is Future is History, and both books are about Russia, right? So Future is History, and the other one is by Gulnash Shepardinova uh, is um, uh, Red Mirror. And I think that those two books, I mean, they kind of argue with each other, but they give this answer for the question about the persistence of Russian nostalgia. And what uh, Gulnaz tried to argue in her book is that 90s was never actually relieved in Russia. There was like a shocking event, a sort of trauma, but uh, people kind of tried to forget about that. And like after 90s, future never come to Russia, right? So Russia is sort of like stopped there uh, and everything which Russia had, the imaginary of this possible future is the past, like this greatness of, as Ilya brilliantly showed in his presentation, this greatness of everlasting empire. And 90s, it is, 90s is a very complicated again, uh, event. It's not just a shock therapy and like poverty and all those mafia guys on the Russian streets and gangs. It's also like sort of liberation as democratic values, people stop participated in politics. There was a lot of creativity there too. But this part uh, of 90s, this imaginary of 90s, did belong only to the very restricted group of Russians, which is like liberals, for all other people. And Putin tried to promote it, as Alex said, uh, during all his terms, right? That 90s is a horrible thing, that thanks God we have Putin, that now 90s are over, and if we won't have Putin, we will have 90s again. So in a way, Russia was never able to survive this uh, the end of the 1991, the end of its empire, right? It's just kind of stuck there. Future never came. And the only image for future Russians have is like this dreams about the lost greatness. And we see in our interviews we collected with Russian citizens about the war, we kind of still see those sentiments there. People don't have any other like images of what we can have. They kind of stuck in between other great Russia who is against the whole world over Europe. Oh gosh, Europe is rejecting us. So there is no future for Russia here, right? And they rely heavily on this very bitter feelings of like resentment. Like, yeah, we want to be great, but we lost our great empire. Russia, we want to be great. And what like, we want the other world be like, look at us and said, yeah, they're strong guys, but they didn't do that. So. We're kind of stuck in night. Russia was never able to really, I don't know, leave through 1991 to like move forward this traumatic point. I see there is a question from Mira, but I wanna bracket that for a little bit and jump to, I'm, I will be sure to come back to it, but um, I'm gonna jump to Peter Radlan's question for Oleg. So if I understand you correctly, the regime tried to depoliticize society in the 2000s and has only partially repoliticized society since 2012. But surely the mobilization around the 
SVO is a pretty special military operation, right? Is that uh, is pretty intense. If this is not a full politicization of Russian society, what would such a full mobilization look like? Can you imagine some additional steps which this state could make to intensify the mobilization? Yeah, uh, thank you. So uh, the paradox is that, uh, again, uh, many supporters uh, of, uh, of the invasion uh, are not really mobilized. So um, they are rather uh, confused and uh, they feel fear. Uh, and that is why uh, precisely the fact that Putin had always uh, tried to demobilize and depoliticize people he tries uh, to uh, avoid military mobilization. Uh, we know that uh, many uh, conservatives, like radical conservative people, even in the Kremlin, like call for, for a military mobilization in order to, uh, to win uh, the war. But I think that Putin himself uh, understand that uh, it would be dangerous uh, for uh, his regime. However, however, the question is uh, if there are if there are some groups uh, of people in our society that are ready to mobilize both politically inside the country and militarily outside the country to provide the regime with a kind of popular support. In this case, in this case, uh, the regime uh, can become like more, more fascist in a classic term, uh, in, 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 in a sense that it is, it is based on, uh, on popular mobilization. So that is why Putin, Putin now uh, faces uh, a very uh, a very hard dilemma uh, uh, because uh, he needs uh, support because uh, it is it is hard to continue the war but at the same time he tries to avoid it and so uh, we'll see what 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 will happen next can I can I briefly continue with this question? So, yes, please. Uh, thank you. So um, one uh, simple illustration uh, to the fact that Russian society is not fully mobilized is that there is repression and persecution against uh, the people like nationalists who actually support the war. So one example is that uh, there is a bookstore a nationalist bookstore in uh, in Moscow called Listva, and it was raided by police. Even though people who gather in this bookstore actually discuss, you know, that it's not a, a bad idea that Russia invaded Ukraine, so they actually supported, but still they were raided by police. Another example is that uh, Igor Kolmogorov, who is this famous nationalist intellectual, uh, he filed for a permit to have uh, a demonstration, a street demonstration in support of the war. So not against the war, but uh, supporting the war. And this permit was denied. And uh, his demonstration was denied because uh, the, the general principle for the government is uh, to deny any kind of grassroots activity, even the activity that supports uh, the regime and supports the war effort. So they don't like any kind of grassroots action and they prefer only to have 100% fully controlled street demonstrations and uh, there was this big rally uh, with Putin himself present that was staged, that was a very carefully orchestrated event, but any kind of uh, independent action, even in support of the war, is uh, prohibited and persecuted, and nationalists are still persecuted in Russia, even though uh, this is the realization of their dreams, 
this this invasion of Ukraine, still, even though they have wanted it for such a long time, still they're not allowed to participate in this in any meaningful way. So this is very characteristic of the Russian state, that they have this distance with society, even the sections of society that uh, support the regime. I have received a question from Will, who is asking, um, uh, either Natalia or Ilya, or maybe even Alek, uh, to speak about the history of the Azov Battalion in Ukraine. So I don't know which one, I know you all are um, experts on Russia. This might require some sort of additional expertise on Ukraine. And I don't wanna put any of you on, on the spot with this question, but if somebody feels, um, that they can speak about this. This should have been really probably a question addressed to the panel uh, that we had a couple of weeks ago uh, by Ukrainian um, scholars, activists, but maybe we can touch base, touch on it right now too. All right, so <clears throat> I can start with this anecdote I don't know uh, whether it's uh, true, but it's still <laughs> rather ironic. So uh, there was a report that, um, uh, so Putin did not know that Azov Battalion is now an official part of uh, the Ukrainian army, which is true. So the, this battalion is not an independent paramilitary force of any kind. It's a uh, it's part of uh, Ukrainian military. And so uh, Pu Putin was informed that Azov Battalion is not some kind of uh, ragtag band of uh, Nazis. It is actually uh, a military unit. And uh, uh, so when some advisor told him that, uh, he didn't believe this advisor. He said, show me the documents. I just don't believe you. This cannot be right. So I know for sure that Azov Battalion is just uh, a band of Nazis who like to kill Russians. And so uh, Putin was presented with some uh, you know, research note about, uh, about this battalion, about its history. And, uh, and then he said, OK, so I was wrong. <laughs> Apparently, it's true that Azov Battalion is really part of the Ukrainian military. So, I mean, this is just a anecdote. I'm, I'm not sure that uh, the, the, this really happened, but uh, I actually believe that this could happen because uh, with, with these kinds of details, uh, Putin's uh, general knowledge of Ukraine is very fuzzy. It's not like Putin knows a lot about internal Ukrainian situation. This is very important to understand that uh, Putin's idea of Ukraine is very, very narrow and limited. And uh, in fact, a lot of uh, military failures of Russia and Ukraine can be explained by the fact that Putin really doesn't know what, what's going on in Ukraine and what has been going on in Ukraine in the last, uh, in the last years and decades. So in relation to, to, to Azov, I mean, uh, I'm not an expert at all, but uh, the brief sketch is that it started as a far-right militia and then it was reintegrated into uh, Ukrainian army. And uh, uh, probably the nationalistic, uh, even Nazi component was moderated within this battalion. So it was not as open as it was before. But of course, some people with right-wing nationalist views, they remained in this battalion. So even though like, generally, probably it was not like a Nazi formation when uh, the war started in 2022. So this is just like a general sketch. And uh, now, as I understand, uh, most of the original uh, fighters in this unit, they are now uh, either dead or captured by Russians in Mariupol. And uh, only, some, only some parts of this battalion are fighting in uh, Kharkiv. And uh, so mostly in Kharkiv, as I understand. So that, that's all I know. Thank you, Ilya, for being so brave. And we, uh, Peter Redland put some uh, really good resources uh, about Azov Battalion in the chat. I uh, recommend that uh, we all uh, look at them. So I'll take a question from uh, Chad Goldberg and then go back to a um, question uh, from uh, Mira. So Chad is asking, and this is a, 
uh, question to Oleg. If different, in different ways, Putin's self-image as a great hist historical figure who will resolve Russian glory, the Putin's uh, regime, apparent liberation of itself from society and the collapse of empires. Uh, the remarks of all three speakers bring to mind the uh, concept of Bonapartism, which has played an important role in Marxist theory. Historical ironies aside, uh, Napoleon's ill invasion of Russia. How useful is the concept of Bonapartism today for understanding Putin and his regime? I think we should we should uh, transfer this question to Ilya, who wrote several uh, articles on uh, uh, how to use uh, the notion of Bonapartism to analyze Russia. Right. So uh, it's true. <laughs> I did write several papers on that. And uh, uh, my, my general idea was that the Russian regime is very similar to the regime of uh, Napoleon III, described by Marx in his famous text, uh, 18th Brumaire of uh, Louis Bonaparte. And so uh, the text is rather complex. So Marx identifies several features of uh, Bonapartist regimes. And the first feature is uh, a completely passive population that is represented by, uh, you know, by, by the leader, but this population cannot influence the decisions of this leader. So they feel that he somehow represents them, but uh, they are unable to democratically enforce any kind of accountability on the leader. And uh, Alek already talked about the passivity of the Russian population. And so in that sense, they really resemble peasants from, uh, uh, you know, from, from uh, 18th Brumaire, this famous description of uh, peasantry, French peasantry, that is completely passive and uh, does not have autonomous grassroots self-organization is only represented by, uh, by the leader at that time, Napoleon. So this is one feature of Bonapartism that you can find in Russia. Another feature is that uh, Marx uh, says that under Bonaparte, the state uh, became so strong that it began to dominate society and um, it even dictated the terms of class struggle. So the state became an autonomous agent and uh, it was not just a pawn in the game of, in the battle of classes, it was an autonomous agent. And uh, with the Russian state, you can also say that that uh, Russian state became a sort of autonomous entity. It was dictating its will to, uh, the, the bourgeoisie, the, the business leaders, and they could not use the state, rather the state used them, let's say. So, um, uh, and uh, just like the peasantry, uh, the business leaders or the bourgeoisie, uh, they were also sort of represented by Bonaparte, as, uh, as Marx wrote, uh, and uh, he was uh, carrying out policies that were beneficial to, to French business, but those businessmen did not influence, you know, the state policy. So it was not a parliamentary republic in which the bourgeoisie ruled, according to Marx. It was this authoritarian regime that was uh, isolated from pressures from society. Nevertheless, it somehow followed uh, the interests of big business. And so I argue in my articles that you can say the same about uh, uh, Putin's regime, that the oligarchs do not really influence Putin's regime, but still uh, in a sort of passive way, this regime uh, implements uh, the interests of uh, big business. So uh, up until this point, I would say. So 2022 is this point in which you cannot see the interests of big business in this decision to launch this invasion. On the contrary, uh, the oligarchs are devastated by this. So their, their fortunes diminish and they lose uh, export markets, they lose access to foreign capital, they lose access to, to everything in the global economy, and it's very bad for business, but they cannot do anything because they live in a Bonapartist regime, which they cannot influence. So uh, Marx said that uh, the state hung upon uh, bourgeoisie like the sword of Damocles. So, and, and the sword finally struck, you can say, in the case of uh, this uh, invasion. Okay. Thank you. That was great. So we have only a few minutes left, and I want to go back to Mira Popovsky's um, question that is, um, as uh, she admits, difficult and also poses to uh, all the speakers. Um, 
and that's what I, that's why I was saving it for the end. So uh, the question is, what do you see as possibilities for changing the narrative within Russia or empowering those who do not support the narrative of the regime? And here also maybe uh, if you want to address a question or fold in question from Gala about um, your evaluation of support of the war for the war among Russian citizens. And if I may even make it more complicated, um, I'm particularly interested in uh, sort of your take on what the left in Russia um, and um, with maybe cooperation for, uh, from the left um, um, elsewhere in the world, across the world, can do to uh, change this narrative? I guess uh, probably I can start talking about like answering this question about narrative about the war in Russia. So as Oleg uh, mentioned, we conducted um, a long, uh, like uh, a lot of interviews with people in Russia about their um, ideas on the war. And we see there like basically three different narratives, three different groups, groups of people that supporters, doubters, and opposers. I mean, that's very roughly, right? Roughly, right? Because there is a lot of differences within those groups. There are just three different logics there. Supporters believe that this war was justified. It was un unavoidable, uh, inevitable, and actually everything will be okay. Sanctions will not destroy Russia. Uh, so um, doctors believe uh, uh, that uh, they don't know the reasons for that war. They cannot justify it themselves, but they believe that there is some other people, Putin, uh, he knew what he was doing. And that's why, I mean, probably there was some reasons for that war, but they don't know what kind of reasons for that. They, uh, but they are much more skeptical about Russian's future and they are more, much more frightened by sanctions and their impact in their own lives. And there is a third group. This is the group of opposers. They don't believe that the war was justified and they really believe Believe that uh, sanctions will destroy Russia, right? And we see, and we don't see now how those like three groups are changing. So probably the number of people who try not to care about this war, like the number of doctors, it's growing. But still, even those people who at the beginning supported the war, uh, they continue to believe that this war was justified, that there was like right reasons for Russia to attack Ukraine. However, some of them now uh, experiencing the effect of sanctions, they start thinking that maybe it should be over right now because the price is kind of uh, too high for Russia to continue that. And I think that uh, the changing narrative in Russia we can see is in the future won't be like, um, anti-war uh, narrative, which is like, yeah, this war was wrong. No, why we believe that Ukraine is not a separate state, why we attack them. We want to have that, but probably we will see much more people who would say, well, yeah, maybe the reasons, maybe there were some reasons for that war. Russia was right to attack Ukraine, but now we want this war to be over because we suffer, because we suffer, because the economy is dropping down, because there are a lot of uh, like deaths, so I think that this is the shift which we uh, can expect. It will not happen right now. Probably it will happen closer to autumn when people come back from the Dutchess and from their summer vacations. And at that point, the sanctions which aimed at stopping Russians, like stopping Russian invasion, it didn't work this way, right? But those sanctions, they will, uh, uh, they will produce long lasting economic effects, which will be pretty bad for Russia. So I think that like at autumn, we can, ex can expect this shift in narrative. But still, as I said, they won't be like, oh my God, what did we do? We shouldn't kill all those Ukrainians. They would be like, yeah, let's stop that. That was like a wrong choice. Maybe next time we can do that, something like that. But now we should stop. Oleg, and then Ilya, or Ilya, and then Oleg. OK, so uh, I think uh, that, uh, you know, uh, re recently, uh, like yesterday, I uh, analyzed one of uh, our interviews we collected uh, from the Russian citizens. And uh, that was the interview with a girl who always supported Putin, who uh, voted for him, uh, who was an Orthodox Church activist, 
and who took part in some kind of conservative pro-Putin uh, pro -Putin civil society organizations. He loves very much, uh, uh, she, she's very young, she uh, graduated from the secondary school like two years ago. She, she loves very much her, uh, her uh, history class teacher who uh, explained to her that uh, like uh, Ukrainians uh, are, are bad guys and Ukraine is like a um, uh, false state. But at the same time, uh, her kind of conservative mood is very moderate. And what she is saying now is that the war is too much. I hate these people with like symbols Z and V, uh, uh, which uh, uh, like uh, uh, which you can see on on tanks and uh, other military machines. Like she is saying that uh, 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 um, I I I don't like uh, to look at at the symbols. So what we see uh, that by Continuing the war, Putin's regime undermines this kind of maybe thin but genuine uh, conservative civil society support. Uh, and that is why I hope that if uh, people will become more and more politicized, they will finally politicized enough when the time for uh, social change will come. Uh, then, uh, within this context, we should uh, understand that the economic situation uh, will become uh, worse soon. And that is why uh, uh, even um, liberal political scientists who uh, don't like leftists uh, say, uh, like, write in, 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 in their Facebook pages, like, uh, maybe there will be, like, worker strikes, worker protests. It is a pity that we don't have strong leftist movement in Russia. Uh, I think that uh, one way is to uh, establish connections with uh, workers, uh, with professionals, with teachers, with doctors, to, uh, to organize them uh, and to offer them some image of the future and some, uh, uh, and some, and some uh, recipe how to overcome the situation which we will face soon, I mean, economic situation. And uh, Western, Western leftists uh, could help us, could help us to develop uh, this kind of program of change, uh, which can be really helpful and useful uh, in the future. Right, so, can I add a few points uh, to this question? So, um, Alec tried to be optimistic. So, I also want to be optimistic, but uh, I, I, I really can't at this point. So, <laughs> I'm not really able to be that optimistic. So, uh, I would like to go back to Alexey Yurchak's book that was already mentioned. Everything was forever until it was no more. So, his point uh, is that, um, the support for the Soviet regime was hollow. It was not a full, fully fledged ideological support. It was more like just passive acceptance of the regime. And so when the Soviet regime collapsed, no one was surprised 
And certainly almost no one was willing to fight for the Soviet regime because people didn't really uh, support it in their hearts. So they were not mobilized. They were just passively accepting the existence of this, you know, Soviet, uh, Soviet thing. And so when this thing collapsed, they were just, okay, so we will live in the new reality. So, but the problem was that the Soviet regime uh, did not collapse because of some social mobilization, because of some protests. It collapsed because of uh, the reform process started from the top. Reform process started by Mikhail Gorbachev. And uh, uh, I think that Putin learned uh, this lesson from Gorbachev and from Russian history. And uh, the, the most important thing for him would be to eliminate the possibility of this kind of top-down liberalization of the regime. Because this is for him the worst thing that happened to our country in, you know, in forever, the collapse of the Soviet Union. And he understands that the cause of this collapse was uh, this attempt at top-down reform. Therefore, uh, he will try to do anything in his power to avoid this kind of top-down reform process similar to Mikhail Gorbachev's. Right? And if, um, if there will be no reformers from the top, I don't think that Russian society uh, you know, will be able to somehow defeat the regime on its own. So, and, and, and hence my pessimism in this, in this question. Nevertheless, uh, I agree with Oleg that there are points of, uh, there are contradictions, there are tensions in Russian society. And it's true that in the coming months, uh, hundreds of thousands of industrial workers will lose their jobs because the factories are closed because of sanctions. They, these are going to be pockets of protest activity. We don't really know what will happen on the front. We don't know how the war in Ukraine will go in the future. It's not clear at all what, will, what are the next steps in this war. So there, are, there is a lot of uncertainty. And so I am quite pessimistic, but at the same time, I, I allow for something new to happen. I think uh, this is possible that something new will happen. Thank you. This is a very good note to end this uh, conversation, although I hope uh, the conversation will continue. And uh, so thank you to all our panelists for their excellent presentations and for their very engaging conversation with us. And thank you all for coming and staying over time. Um, we hope you'll join the uh, Haven's Rights Center in the fall for um, the annual Visiting Scholars pro Program. Thank you all once again, and we'll see you in the fall. Thank you. Thank you for inviting us.